And uh, good day, our dear colleagues, our dear friends. And uh, I would like to thank you, everyone, who is able to be presented today in our live stream. And today I'm honored and happy to see as our invited global expert of the medical tourism and the healthcare, uh, Mr. Paolo Moreira, who is the editor of the International Healthcare Management Journal, Taylor Today, Mr. I think we have stabilize it. Mr. Mark. Yes, we can. Um, I, um, I didn't hear you very well, so I think there's some... Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. That's really nice. Okay. Can have you heard? Have you heard? Have you heard what I've been talking to you? No, sorry. No. There was a connection went off. I think. Can you hear me now? Yeah, for the time being. Yeah, that's nice. That's nice. So just uh, uh, again, just I'm really glad to see today our, our invited expert, uh, Mr. Paolo Moreira from Oxford, Ukraine, from uh, as the editor of the International Healthcare Management Journal um, and the Taylor and Francis. Uh, good day, Mr. Moreira. Hello, my pleasure. <laughs> Thank you for being with us today and thank you for devoting the time to uh, share your expertise and experience about the healthcare global development at the moment. And uh, I'm really hopeful that you will be able to share with the audience uh, what are the global trends of the healthcare at the moment. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Can you please? Can you please tell me uh, what is your opinion at the moment, how the global healthcare market development in uh, the current realities, what is going on in the global healthcare market and what are the new challenges, uh, which are the clinics and the healthcare uh, establishments are facing? Well, I think there, there have been... Um... Um, negative impacts on health systems and also some positive impacts. I think it's important that we uh, always see crisis in this uh, dual perspective, that there's all crises bring bad things and all crises bring good things. So on the bad things, um, what has happened now is that we realize that the uh, logistics chains or the chain of logistics in healthcare are very weak and fragile. And the, uh, the, the case with the uh, um, protective um, um, personal equipment is uh, a, uh, you know, a, a sign of that uh, uh, fragile um, uh, structure. So when, when health systems lack on protective personal equipment, that's a very, very bad sign. So that means that health systems were not ready for this. Um, and health professionals were put at risk. Um, and another very negative thing that happened was speculation around these equipments. So masks that usually cost maybe 60 cents 
um, now or for the past few weeks uh, have been selling for uh, nine euros per mask. At some point, the Europeans were selling masks to China at nine or 10 euros per mask. Um, and later, which is uh, interesting, um, which is now at this moment, China is selling masks back to Europe. Right. Also, also still at a, at a much higher price than normal. So th this is a bad thing that happened. Um, and another bad thing that happened with this crisis is that uh, at some point, uh, health systems were only taking care of COVID-19 patients as if all the other patients disappeared. So there was nothing else in health systems but COVID. And that is very negative. Uh, it's a form of negligence towards other patients. So anyone who is not a COVID-19 patient in many health systems uh, is not important anymore. And that is very negative. And that, of course, will have very bad consequences, um, which we will start noticing in, in a few months. For now, the news is all and only about COVID. But in a few weeks, maybe months, we will be um, uh, watching the news on how bad this was for other patients. So these are negative uh, aspects. The, the positive aspects, there are some also. Um, one is cooperation. So uh, new forms of cooperation have evolved. We see that, for instance, in the pharmaceutical industry, where companies like Sanofi and Glaxo are cooperating to produce the vaccine. And that, that is very interesting to see. Uh, other forms of cooperation between health systems um, and between healthcare organizations have also been uh, um, identified. So that's one good thing. Uh, another um, uh, interesting aspect uh, of uh, positive aspect of this crisis was that um, we, um, we, we understand now the importance of social epidemiology. So epidemiology in the past was only and solely um, focusing on bioclinical data and now uh, we realize that there's this thing called social epidemiology. And that's, that is interesting for us as um, people who work in the health system. And one third um, positive uh, impact of this crisis is the uh, new awareness of this uh, so-called global village in, in health. So in, in, in the past, people understood that the world is interconnected, right? There's, there's just one planet Earth, one world economy, one human society. But uh, for some people, that was just theory. And now in health systems, we realize that um, there is this um, sense of global village in healthcare. Um, so anything that happens on the other side of the world affects us and anything that happens here where we are can affect health systems on the other side of the world. And obviously, um, wellness tourism and medical tourism, international patients movements, uh, it's part of that. It's part of this global village of healthcare. And I think the awareness of the existence of a, a kind of um, interconnected health system in the world has um, uh, grown during this um, crisis. So that, that's a third positive aspect of the crisis. And yeah. can you tell me uh, what, what is your opinion? What new directions, what new trends will appear after the COVID-19 uh, will somehow slow a little bit down? New trends in healthcare, new trends in the wellness maybe, uh, so any opinion from your side? Um, new trends, um, 
don't start just on, on the back of the crisis, but what is happening and what will happen is that um, uh, trends that were already evolving will gain some more importance and other trends uh, will lose. But one trend that has been evolving for a few years um, and that will now grow very much is digital health. So digital health right. solutions will now very quickly gain um, um, a more clear role. Um, it's obvious that the uh, COVID-19 crisis will happen um, again. So there will be some other virus. If not COVID-19, will be COVID-21 or 20 or some other. So uh, it, um, pandemics like, uh, like this one will occur frequently in the future. Um, that's normal. It's nothing to be scared of. Um, but health systems have now the opportunity to prepare their digital procedures, digital health solutions to be ready, uh, not just for pandemics, but also for a new uh, approach to healthcare. So we've been talking about this for over 20 years. So it started as telemedicine, it evolved as telecare, telehealth, um, right. and uh, these days, well, e-health or digital health. Um, so there's a, a, a great variety, a very large diversity of um, solutions that can uh, be the best options for, for people who don't uh, want to go out of home or, or can't go out of their homes to get access to most of the healthcare services that um, uh, in traditional health systems still oblige patients to go to hospitals. So in a word, uh, a main trend that we'll see happening will be the, the adoption of solutions where health systems and hospitals can um, offer services for patients who stay at home. And that was something that this um, pandemic has clearly demonstrated um, and also uh, created the, the awareness in, uh, amongst citizens. So citizens now are thinking that um, it's dangerous to go to hospitals. Well, they should have known that for a long time, but now there's this awareness. It's, it's not a very good idea to go to hospitals unless you really need it. And right. this puts the question of, is there a way that I can uh, um, access health services without going to the hospital? And, and this is where it will come uh, into uh, that um, uh, perspective. Mm -hmm. And uh, just, I don't see you, if you can switch on again the camera. It's okay, something happened to the camera. Yeah. We can carry on talking. Yeah, yeah. Just actually, and I, I was asking as well, uh, you, how do you think, how Ukraine as the destination is positioned on the global market of the medical and the wellness tourism uh, to, be, to provide the digital health care or after the uh, COVID-19 for people to come to Ukraine and to consider Ukraine as the destination of the medical and the wellness tourism. What is your opinion on this point? Yes, well, um, I think now most health systems have uh, uh, an opportunity to uh, invest more on their digital health solutions and um, to offer um, new packages of services. Um, obviously, um, some health systems are more prepared than others uh, to uh, adopt uh, the digital health um, solution, um, but it's not very complicated or 
uh, it's not even a, a very uh, large investment uh, to uh, be um, capable of offering uh, this kind of uh, um, packages. So uh, I think the combination of digital health services with uh, um, the, the physical presence of patients uh, in, and in healthcare organizations will grow and will become more uh, visible to, um, um, to uh, well, in, in most health systems. And, yeah. and sorry, yeah. Uh, you've been to Ukraine a couple of times, and uh, the first time when I firstly met you, you visited uh, one of the conferences of the medical tourism in Ukraine. Uh, I hope that you somehow are is knowledgeable about the hospitals and clinics and about the sanatoriums of Ukraine, the level and the services which they are providing. What is your opinion? How the uh, global patients and the global wellness travelers, will they consider Ukraine as the destination for the wellness and the medical tourism? Mm. Yeah, well, I've, I've been to the Ukraine many times, not, not just a couple, but uh, yeah. Um, yeah, well, obviously there's um, um, a lot of potential in, in Ukraine, um, not only in Kiev, but in, in other natural um, nature-based um, regions, um, like Odessa or a few others. Um, um, so, mountains. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. So there's there's quite a lot of potential there. Um, the um, uh, I think the main thing, like in, in any other uh, country, is that there is uh, uh, a national strategy to uh, combine wellness and the more traditional biomedical uh, services. And, and and cooperation, so cooperation with the tourism sector, um, cooperation with uh, the airlines, um, and uh, also uh, good um, um, cooperation with the uh, insurance, health insurance companies. Uh, and then it's a matter of targeting. So um, I think the Ukraine already has um, good experience in, in uh, wellness tourism and, and medical tourism. Um, so the, the concept of international patient is not um, uh, yet fully developed. Um, it has uh, had some, um, well, some, some, uh, some difficulties in the past. Um, um, there, there is, anyway, um, a large number of um, patients uh, around the world, and in Europe in particular, that are willing to go to another country to uh, use um, uh, this type of um, services, namely if it's combining wellness and biomedical care. Um, and the, the important thing now after this uh, COVID crisis is to launch the, the campaigns and the offers. Uh, obviously, um, bearing in mind that um, there is an economic crisis coming through, especially in Europe, um, it may not be a very long crisis, um, but it definitely will affect health systems. In, uh, again, in negative and in positive ways. One of the things that is obvious now, once we start talking about other things besides COVID-19, is that there will be a lot, a uh, very long waiting list for other procedures because health systems essentially stop caring about any other patients than, uh, well, apart from COVID-19. And that means, obviously, that other patients have been waiting for their surgeries, for their care. So most European countries will now have 
extremely long waiting lists, waiting times for other types of procedures besides the ones associated with COVID-19, which creates the need um, for, again, international cooperation. Um, so naturally, another thing that is happening is the, the shifts in health, health budgets. So governments are, are now taking money away from other areas to put them, to put the money into COVID-19, uh, into uh, all sorts of things. And the next big expense will be the, the vaccine. So that means that, again, in other areas of care, it's likely that there will be uh, cuts and there will be more problems for patients to get access. There may be even longer waiting lists. So um, the, the, I would say that the, the, the impact of COVID on other areas of care uh, will be diverse, but one thing is that um, patients will, will see that their access is now more difficult and uh, those who can are likely to look for um, offers in another country. And naturally, uh, Ukraine has a number of uh, advantages and competitive advantages uh, to uh, many other countries. I completely agree with you that uh, Ukraine has... Uh One is the uh, prior, uh, the other is the less waiting times. So Ukraine is, as the destination, is one of the possible destinations which the global healthcare travelers will choose as uh, their destination for taking the procedures. Uh, but the question is, uh, actually it was one of the questions from our audience. Uh, what is your opinion? Will the patients travel uh, to other countries to take the healthcare services, taking into account that it may uh, actually damage their health and they can actually get infected by the COVID-19 while traveling? Or will they travel or they will better prefer to stay in home country and wait a little bit more for the surgery in order to prevent the infection of the COVID? Well, um, sooner or later, people will have to come back to their normal uh, way of um, seeing these things. There have always been viruses around us. There will always be viruses around us. And maybe some people with this COVID-19 learned to protect themselves from virus, not just from COVID-19, but from all of them. Uh, okay. Um, so and naturally, if uh, we go from one country to another, these days, um, it's likely that we come from a country where there is COVID-19 and we go to a country where there is also COVID-19. So um, soon we understand that this quarantine um, doesn't make any sense. I mean, it would make sense if you go, if, you, if a patient comes from a country where there is COVID-19, but he, he or she comes to a country where there is no COVID-19, then um, the, the quarantine makes sense. But when everybody has had the experience and uh, the, the virus is circulating everywhere, this, um, so the quarantine uh, stops making sense. Um, the question on whether will patients travel or not, it's a matter of trust. I mean, people, shouldn't, shouldn't, uh, they should not um, stop traveling just because they're afraid of the virus, because the virus may be, uh, you know, anywhere. Um, and naturally, we, we realize that uh, uh, the conditions, the climate conditions will now be 
uh, favorable favorable to uh, uh, a different um, impact of, of this virus. So, namely in the summer and with the heat. Um, so the um, I, I also believe that uh, the uh, the vaccine will be there will be vaccines ready. Uh, at the moment, there are over a hundred uh, projects of developing a vaccine around the world, and at least eight of them are already on, on the clinical trial phase, which means that it's most likely that we will have a, a vaccine, in, if not in August, probably in September. Um, obviously, these vaccines are most likely to come from China, and from a couple of other countries, maybe not from the US, maybe not from, from other European countries. Maybe the UK can be one of those first countries to have the vaccine. But above all, uh, people will start uh, thinking and realizing that um, the, um, the world has to go back to normal and uh, we have learned how to deal with the COVID-19. And now, um, because there will be very long waiting times, waiting lists on most national systems, I think patients shouldn't be afraid of traveling, uh, keeping in mind, obviously, the, uh, their protective um, behaviors, which they should have anyway, whether there was uh, COVID-19 or, or not. It's something that can be part of a, a sort of health literacy of, of citizens. Right. But what do you think in general about the medical tourism industry? Are before the COVID-19 um, industry, it had been dropping a lot. And we have lots of hospitals who are working only for the uh, international patients. What do you think in the current realities, uh, what will happen with the industry of the medical tourism? Well, the, uh, the tourism industry as a whole um, is probably one of the industries that was hit harder on the COVID together with the uh, the oil industry and a couple of others. Um, so um, how will tourism uh, recover is the first challenge because medical tourism is part of the whole of the tourism industry. Yeah. Um, what I see currently is for instance, some very countries that depend a lot on tourism like Spain, Portugal, Italy, Greece, Turkey, and so on. They are cooperating, for instance, to develop uh, a certificate for uh, on COVID protection uh, hotels. So uh, there's uh, this project of uh, uh, applying uh, an international certificate so that tourists are, are uh, they feel higher trust on going to that hotel. So that will be a hotel that has um, adopted all sorts of procedures to protect their clients from uh, COVID-19. And so they get a certificate. So, mm -hmm. and, and in this way, it's, um, it's, it's a kind of a trust um, uh, stamp for, for patients. So that's a good example of how the uh, tourism industry is trying to survive uh, by creating um, uh, conditions to regain the trust of clients. Uh, so why would people be fearful of traveling at this point? Because they're, they may be afraid of uh, being infected. But if they go to a hotel that has been certificated or that has been cert certified, that has had the certificate that they um, practice all the protective um, um, measures to prevent um, their clients from being infected, then that's a positive thing. Um, I think it's, it's um, an example that should be considered in medical um, tourism. So uh, um, if clinics or hospitals 
are very dependent on international patients, then they should also be able to demonstrate that they have uh, now changed their procedures and that they adopted the, uh, the, the, the best and the most advanced procedures to protect their patients from being infected. Now, this, this has always been important anyway for hospitals because we've been trying to fight hospitals infections for the past three decades. And in many countries, in many health systems, the infection rate uh, acquired in hospitals is very high. And it's not COVID-19, it's, it's, uh, sometimes it's much worse. Uh, so so the, 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 the focus on healthcare management to protect patients from infections is already there. But I think for medical tourism uh, institutions, there's the need of a new communication approach. So they, they need to communicate clearly that um, they have worked on uh, guaranteeing that their patients will not be infected, um, in this case by COVID, but in fact, will not, shouldn't be infected by any other virus. Um, so that's one way. Um, another way, obviously, is to move quickly to yeah, digital, digital health um, uh, services. Um, but o overall, I mean, it's, it's, um, it will be a process. Um, so, yeah. So your, your recommendations to Ukrainian doctors, Ukrainian clinics, Ukrainian the safety accreditation of their species in order to increase the trust for the international and the local patients, right? Any other, any other recommendations for the clinics, doctors, sanatoriums uh, of how to regain their business volume of how in the international market, uh, how it's better to get the credibility on the international market. What are your suggestions to the Ukrainians and actually all global healthcare providers? Yes, well, um, one way is, of course, to uh, cooperate with, um, with scientific um, journals like, like mine, um, um, because it's important that um, the uh, healthcare organizations publish case studies on their activity, on their success, on their efforts to improve quality, to improve safety, to improve efficiency, to improve satisfaction of patients. So the credibility of any health system it's very much based on their published research, but also published evidence on improvements. Um, and in some countries, um, they, the managers don't uh, value enough the importance of publishing, for instance, uh, scientifically validated um, evidence of their, their work, but uh, also um, very practical case studies on medical tourism or international patients um, services. Um, so that's, and, and, it sh and obviously, uh, ideally, that evidence should be uh, on an international base, so an independent source. Um, mm -hmm. So that, that's always the way to create um, um, higher credibility. Another way, of course, is to uh, um, establish partnerships, international partnerships. Um, so uh, some, in some countries, um, some uh, organizations, healthcare organizations, are willing to uh, send their patients in a cooperative plan to other countries uh, and also to receive patients from that other country. So cooperation between healthcare organizations is possible uh, beyond the traditional 
uh, cooperation between health ministries. So obviously in Europe, there's a lot of cooperation between uh, health ministries, but that's more on the professional, on the health professional side, uh, and sometimes on training, uh, which is good. But in when it comes to international patients, it has to be an initiative from 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 the organizations themselves. So if you if you in Ukraine you have like ten clinics or fifteen clinics, and you establish some kind of consortia to uh, uh, establish international cooperation, that is a very strong practical way of coming and establishing some cooperation with other healthcare organizations. Um, plus, the, the fact that if you have a consortium, a cooperation between a number of clinics, it's also easier to generate evidence to publish and to uh, publish a number of articles. So imagine if in my journal I publish like 10 um, case studies about um, clinics in, in, uh, in the Ukraine uh, working around international patients with very good results. That's a long-term impact because um, decision makers, managers around the world, they read these um, uh, case studies, they read this evidence. Because as you know, in, in international patients, I mean, patients look themselves for uh, solutions in other countries, but they also ask their own professionals. And if their own professionals have read about uh, how good services are in, in another country, then they can recommend the, to their patients uh, to, uh, to go to that country and not to another country. Naturally, the process is, um, not as simple as this, but when it comes to increasing um, credibility, one key aspect is um, communication, but um, bearing in mind that scientific communication is the highest credibility uh, a health system can have. So if there are scientific papers um, testifying that international patients uh, are very well treated in, um, in the Ukraine. This is the, the best credibility effort that can be um, developed by uh, any health system. Yeah, great. Thank you, dear Paolo, for such uh, knowledgeable and experienced advices. And uh, thank you a lot that you devoted today, uh, this time to being with us. And also uh, taking this opportunity, I would like to invite you to be our uh, Medical and Wellness Tourism Council and just to be an invited expert for okay. our global experts. Yeah, just, just uh, we will be really glad to see you with us. Uh, so just... Uh, to add, uh, you're welcome to add. Uh, well, I, I didn't hear it very well, but... Um, yeah, I'm just... That... Okay, yeah. yeah. Just was telling that uh, if you have something else to add to our discussion, you're welcome to add. Uh, if not, so uh, we will be finishing our interview. Yeah, okay. Well, I think, I think the, the only thing I'd like to add, which is very important for, for the present and for the future, is that um, um, uh, we should all um, put more efforts into developing health literacy amongst um, citizens. Um, because the low health literacy has created a number of problems around COVID-19. A lot of mistaken misconceptions have been going around about the virus and this created a lot of unnecessary um, difficulties for health systems and for health professions. And it shows again that we should invest more in, uh, in health literacy in, in general um, to avoid in the future to be facing again uh, a new threat where the low literacy of, of, of citizens 
creates a lot of um, panic and unnecessary fear. And that's uh, valid for any uh, clinical um, area. Um, and that's one important thing. Maybe you can um, work around that in the future too, or in the present. to the patients and to the clinics as well and to assist the Ukrainian clinics and healthcare institutions and to uh, to assist them to help them to position their services so, yes. so and I hope that with your help uh, with your presence in our council as the expert we will be able to do uh, a lot more things in order to position Ukraine on the international market and uh, to attract in, in art here with yes. So thank, thank you for being with us and uh, we're really hoping to see you as soon as possible in Ukraine. Yes, yes, me too. Thank you. Okay. Have a nice day. Thank you. you. Too, you too. Thank you. Bye bye.